I'm Duncan McLeod, and you're listening to the Tech Central podcast. I'm at the Milk and Sugar studio in Parkhurst today for a debate on e-tolls with two people who know more about the subject than probably anyone in this country. I have no doubt this is going to be an interesting and robust debate about a subject that has many South Africans hot under the collar. So, to speak against the e-toll system, I'm very pleased to welcome someone who I think needs no introduction to South Africans, and that's Wayne Duvenage, CEO of the organization Undoing Tax Abuse, or better known as OUTA. Outer. Yeah. Uh, and in the other corner, as it were, to argue in favor of the e-toll system, I'd like to welcome Kuni Fermark. Kuni is CEO of Electronic Toll Collection, or ETC, the company responsible for the management and collection of e-tolls on behalf of Sanral. Gentlemen, welcome to the Tech Central podcast, and thanks for joining me. Nice Thank you. So, uh, the way we're going to do this today is I'm going to ask you both to spend just a couple of minutes explaining your point of view uh, on the subject. I'm going to start with Kuni, and then we'll go over to you, Wayne. Mm. Kuni, you were quoted in the media a couple of weeks ago mm. uh, saying that you used to be one of the majority of people who refused to pay their e-tolls, mm. but that you've changed your mind about the system. Um, first of all, why have you changed your views um, beyond beyond the fact, of course, that you now work for ETC? Mm. And why do you believe the e-toll system as it is currently stands is the right one? Yeah, I, th I think, thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, I think what we have seen is, and, and I would probably be part of that um, group of, of citizens that I think over a number of years have become, become a bit complacent. Um, if we look at uh, the uh, public participation that we had when uh, e-tolls were declared and uh, the public participation process that followed, I think uh, it is, was not as robust as what we see currently for with a land claim issue. And, um, and so that, I think, encourages me quite a lot to see that actually South Africans are becoming more and more involved. Um, simply put, I think uh, I've been quite ignorant about it. Um, my, my initial po uh, uh, reason for, for paying it was because, I mean, you cannot support an organization and then not, not pay. Um, but if we look at, uh, because I think that what has also happened is that there's been really one voice out there. Um, and that has been the voice of OTA, I think. Um, and what we have seen and experienced is, is that um, perhaps not all the facts are out in the open for public to make a make a uh, informed decision. So, what changed for you? I mean, you were an, you were one of the people who was refusing yeah. to pay e tolls. What did you base that on, and what facts changed in your mind that yeah. you now pay? So, so the initial facts was well, the system is illegal. Um, but when you actually read through the case law, you see that uh, it, the system is not illegal. Um, the system is fully legal and was sanctioned by the courts. So from that perspective, I mean, it then becomes a valid tax and, and people should just be paying. Um, I think there was also misconceptions around, so what are the fees and is this an exorbitant amount of thousands of rands per month? Um, you know, when I had to settle my bill, it was an extraordinary amount of money. But um, when you get to understand the system and you understand, for example, that the cap currently is 266 rand per month, then it becomes quite an affordable um, um, uh, ways and means of actually contributing to, uh, to toll. Um, I think, again, when you start reading about and getting informed about um, the GFIP, which is the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Scheme, um, which was devised early 2000s. I mean, the technology was, in my view, early 2000s, the technology was decided on, even way before CUPS uh, was on the, on, on the horizon. The, um, the real issue is that there are three phases. Currently, what we see is only phase one was ever implemented. There's another 158 kilometers of brand new road that needs to be built as part of phase two. So, I think uh, when when the public has not been well informed to make uh, decisions, and when people hear only one voice, and when people only hear one side of the story, I, I, I think it's impossible for people to come to any other conclusions. It's it's like if people constantly say that, um, for example, that um, there was corruption and nobody opposes corrupt, uh, that argument, then that becomes de facto uh, uh, an acceptable standard for people. All right, Wayne, let me bring you in here. 
Outer was founded originally to take on the mm. eTolls project. <coughs> Um, the organization has since morphed into fighting a lot of other mm. causes. Um, but eTolls remains one of your primary focuses. Mm. What, in your view, is wrong with the system? I mean, someone has to pay for the road upgrades. Oh, absolutely. The the and we've never said that we shouldn't pay for the road upgrade, mm -hmm. by the way. I think quite the contrary. Uh, at the time, the people were in the dark. The people were ignorant. And it was Arta, took Arta. And Kasatja and others, by the way, and it's not just Arta. I think, uh, as, as Kuni says, uh, there's not one voice there. There's Kasatja, there are political parties. Every single political party but the ruling party voted against this, by the way. And if you go out into the uh, streets and you ask people if they know of Arta, it's not as uh, widespread as people think. If it, well, I mean, we wish we were that powerful, but we're not. Mm. So the reality is that at the time, Nobody knew what was going on with eTolls, in fact. And when it was introduced, uh, the whole fleet industries, the big players, uh, I was the CEO of Avis at the time, learned for the first time in 20, 2010, just after the World Cup, that uh, these things that were been being built on the side of the roads were going to be used to uh, you know, debit us for the use of these roads uh, and, and the, this upgrade. It was a nice upgrade. We've got nothing wrong with Sandrell's engineers that build good roads. So, so let's also clear that thing that we're just anti-Sandrell, anti-government, not at all. Uh, but what we started to find out as we dug deeper is that Sandrell had run roughshod absolutely roughshod over meaningful public consultation. It's very important, uh, Section 195 of the Constitution, that you do this properly. And what they did was placed one advert in six newspapers. Literally, that's what they did. Very ambiguous, and they got 28 responses, and they ticked the box of, of, of public consultation. And that's a very, very sad situation because we have three and a half million motorists, and that wasn't the case. And the more we engaged, and by the way, we tried to find solutions to our industry, and the more we engaged with industry players out there, the more we realized how much society was kept in the dark, how little we knew about this process. And the more we looked into it, the more we see why these schemes fail around the world, and they do, uh, why this one had all the hallmarks of failure. And what we didn't want to do was become uh, an industry or just individuals or people that were partially uh, part of the system when many people were not going to ever pay. They were never going to pay, whether Arta was here or not. And whether your compliance levels are at 60 or 70 or even 80% on a user pay scheme, that's a failure. And this one, they said in court, was going to get to 93.7% uh, compliance. Well, it never achieved 40%. Now, they might attribute some of that to us, but not all of it. And, uh, and, and so we sit here today with a completely failed scheme, 25% uh, compliance. San Ross says 30. Who, let's, give, let's split that in the middle, then 27%. And, uh, and, 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 and it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense when you have alternatives and we have to express that and explain it. So we became uh, the conscience uh, of, of society. We started to expose grossly misleading information being put out by Sanral, grossly misleading information about the scheme and, 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 and about the, uh, the, the, the workability thereof, uh, about the tenders. I mean, you know, ETC got this uh, uh, contract. They won it at 6.2 billion rand. When you find the agreements are signed, it's over 10 billion rand. There's a 77% increase in the operations service con uh, element of that contract. We've got no formal answers from, from government, and we need answers to that. So this thing is flawed in many respects. I'd like to explore the alternatives in some so detail can, can, a bit. Can I respond to it? Of course you can, yes. Mm. I think I think not everything that Wayne is is alluding to is is absolutely accurate. If you read Sunrose's latest financial reports, there's actually a statement made by the Auditor General to say that there are there were a number of complaints regarding the tender process. In fact, uh, I've got a copy of the uh, audit uh, the the Public Protectors report that indicated that um, the tender process that Sunrose followed has been totally cleared. So, and that's also reported as uh, as part of Sunrose Financials to by the Auditor General acknowledging the Public Protector Report dated February this year, um, and clearing Sunrose of 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 any um, uh, you know inappropriateness or, or or not following any protocols or procedures in awarding the tender. Or the, for the for the ETC contract. Yes. 
Okay, but we need explanations because because you cannot win a tender on 6.2 billion rand and, and 4.7 was the portion of the operations services section and, and, and the contract is signed and it's, 10, it's just over 10 billion rand. That's a 77% increase. There has been no formal explanation to the people. I'm but, talking about to the public. But even the 10 billion, I think, Wayne, is not really an accurate figure. If you look at even currently spending after eight years, it's just over 4 billion. Mm-hmm. So... There's no way that uh, the contract will get to 10 billion. I do not understand exactly how uh, the contract gets to 4 billion. For example, one of the aspects that could be a contributing factor to that is the escalation clause. The CPI clause um, allows for uh, price escalation because you know we have inflationary increases. So if I still do work at the rate of 2009 or 2010, obviously, I mean, the cost is more than doubled no, uh, by then. That's, but that's not the but point. The, the reality of this is, is that uh, the public protector's report very clearly indicates, and, and I mean, the only thing that I can say about the public protector's report is that there's a very specific clause in it to say that um, if you do have a copy of this, you cannot distribute it. So I do recommend Ota gets it from the public protector themselves uh, or from Sonno. Have you read that report, Wayne? No. Not yet. Okay. So I just wanted to ask you before we move on mm. and talk a bit about the history mm. of this, Wayne. Do you support the idea of user pays or would you prefer to see a difference? I think we would be very silly to say that we don't support user pays. I mean, user pays in the context of it being efficient and applied properly, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You don't pay electricity, it gets switched off. Yeah. But when you try to apply it in the context of, of, of roads like this, a drive now, pay later scheme, you best make sure that you got all your systems and your processes right, 100%. And so it works very well in London. It works very well in Stockholm and in a number of places in the world. But it has also failed grossly in other places of the world. And when you start relying on e-natus, which e themselves say that is not uh, uh, accurate, when you rely on the post office to get your post to uh, people so they can be- enjoy the benefits of the discounted rates, when you're relying on, on, on enforcement, on R2, for instance. And this whole scheme, by the way, was written with R2 in mind. R2 was never, still isn't implemented to this day and it was written as if R2 was going to be implemented so when you cannot enforce a user pay scheme when you cannot manage manage it administer it well then don't go there especially when you have alternatives which by the way are are significantly cheaper you know you've got a a massive cost on ETOL here and you've got a zero cost in, 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 in the current systems which are used by the way right now the Mount Edgecombe freeway system Four lane highways from Mabeni to Amschlanger Rocks, beautiful floodlit, not paid through, through an e tolling system, paid, through, paid for through existing tr- uh, grants from Treasury. Uh, and by the way, the new freeway that's going to be widened, uh, similar to this one here from Peter Maritzburg to Durban, will not be tolled. I mean, how do you think they're financing that? They're financing it through taxes, through fuel levies, through allocations. So there is a way to do it. They can do it. They are doing it. Why would you not do it here if you had that option? Well, I think the, I think it's about context, Wayne. So in my view, if I look at the Mount Edgecombe development, um, the Mount Edgecombe interchange is worth 1.6 billion rand. If you look at phase one of the GFIP, was well, I mean, Sun, the official figures is that Sunro spent 22.5 billion rand. So, yes, it is easier to fund uh, out of the fiscus 1.6 billion over, le- and not over one year, but over a number of years, compared to finding 22.5 billion rand. Um, so, I think context is also important because scale is fundamentally different. Yeah. The the one thing about um, the GFIP is that there's this argument to say that what we have today is is not a workable solution. But I think people need to understand that the GFIP was not envisaged to just be this extension. Mm-hmm. The GFIP is envisaged to be 600 kilometers of road under the in this network, mm. um, of which. They are, the next phase, phase two, is really important because it alleviates uh, a lot of congestion that we already experience on the road. Um, but to find 22.5 billion rand, I think, is a, is, is a lot more difficult for government than it is to find 1.7 billion for Mount Edgecombe's interchange. Well, I think let's put that into context. It wasn't 22, it was actually 17.9, and it shouldn't have been more than 10. Okay, but let's, well, that's an argument for another day. The road construction, by the way, was inflated and heavily. And we can show you on some work packages compared to others, massive increases and for the same work done when you remove the interchanges and that. But the freeway between uh, Peter Maritzburg and Durban is over 15 billion. 
Mm-hmm. How's that being financed? Let's put that into context. That is not uh, going to be told, and that has been stated it will not be told. So we must pay tolls in Gauteng, but not them. And they're financing that through an existing mechanism. What is that mechanism? It's not tolls. Well, so what it, do you think it is? Well, it is certainly not a fuel levy. Well, it's coming from the tre- treasury, isn't it? So it is. It is. But then we have to be clear. It is not. It is not uh, funded through a fuel levy. It's funded through the fiscus. Yes, the, the fiscus, fiscus is, is fed by the fuel levy. Is is fed. Well, the fuel levy is the fourth largest yes. contributor to the fiscus. Yes, exactly. So what we have is you've got VAT, you've got other taxes, mm-hmm. you've got many um, other forms of income that government's got. What we also have to be very clear on is that when people pay uh, for the fuel levy, then the issue about the fuel levy is is that um, it it doesn't go into one a, a segregated pot where people can say this is fuel levy money and we can use it on 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 infrastructure. It goes into the fiscus. It goes into one big pot, and that becomes part of the money that government has to spend. And yes, I mean Wayne, you're right. Eighty five percent of the roads in South Africa gets funded from the fiscus, which is fantastic because it is a lot better than it is international. If you go to um, the United States, then you'll see that only 62% of their fiscus funds roads. If you go to London or or, uh, Europe, you'll see that 70% of roads there gets funded through the fiscus. The other 30% or the other 38%, and in our case, the other 15% is funded through um, the user pay principle, which is what we commonly call uh, tolling projects. So it is an accepted norm. I think the fact that South Africa, with its massive um, caveats, I mean, we've the, 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 dif- the difference between the people that are affluent and not affluent is huge. So we have different challenges in South Africa. We, we have challenges that we have to build a lot of RDP houses. We have to build schools. We have to build hospitals. We have, to, we have income grants that are huge, a huge burden on, on the state coffers. So our situation is unique. But even in that instance, we have funded 85% of the roads through the normal fiscus, which I think mm. government has done a fantastic job. But... There is 15% of the road that is not funded through the fiscus, and the GFIP is one of them. The question is, and I think Wayne asked it as well, is is is, is it enforceable, particularly in the Gauteng Freeways con- context, given how much, um, uh, how many, many people are boycotting the system, is there any realistic hope of ever enforcing it? Uh, I, th- I, I mean, honestly, if we took, talk about what's acceptable uh, or what's accepted, they are on the GFIP, there are three uh, regions. There's Ekurileni. Ekurileni never adopted R2. So mm-hmm. they work on uh, CPA, which is Criminal Prosecution Act. Um, Johannesburg and Swane adopted R2. So they work under the R2 laws. All right. There is an R2 amendment bill that is currently still with... with, uh, with um, NCOP. NCOP. <laughs> and once that gets uh, amended, um, that will enforce uh, the what they call the R2 block, which means that uh, not paying for ETOLs will be tantamount to be given a, um, an infringement notice, and you'll have to pay that before you can se- increase your, um, or how can I say, settle your, um, renew your license. <laughs> enforcement is important. I agree with you. I mean, I think enforcement could have been done um, obviously a lot better, um, like many things that we could have done better on this project. I mean, communication, in my view, can also be better. Um, I think what is really important, though, is, is that this is not a scheme that is tarnished with corruption. This is not a scheme that has been given to a cup, uh, or a foreign company, um, you know, in, in the back of a corner this is an open process. I mean, Sunroll's procurement processes have always been transparent. And, and that's what the Public Protector Report confirms. So I have a lot of appreciation, Wayne, for the work that you guys do around identifying corruption. Um, I think there is, there is so much important work to be done in South Africa around, you know, highlighting the, the bird, what's, ha- what's been wronged in the past because we have to bring people to book. Mm. The one thing that I can say, however, is that there's no corruption here at, on, on the GFIP. Yes, it's a scheme that is that is not necessarily accepted by all the people, but I also believe that people have not been informed. Now, I'm not here to try and convince people otherwise. All that I'm busy with is to say, 
just hear the other side of the facts and still make the decision. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is, is important, is that we have a balanced view around what are the facts. So just coming back to enforceability, Wayne, um, mm. uh, Kuni is suggesting that the AOTO legislation is going to force motorists uh, to mm. pay their ETOLs in order to get a new license disc on their cars, and if mm. they don't do that, they're obviously in violation and can't drive. Is that legal? No, um, it is uh, unconstitutional. You cannot have one law impacting on another. The revenues that are generated from vehicle licenses are regional and uh, uh, provincial and local, uh, whereas tolling is a national matter, firstly. Secondly, uh, there are many flaws in the amendments to the R2 bill, and if it is signed, it will be interdicted. Uh, because we've gone through it and, and there are uh, mm -hmm. extremely gro gross flaws. And thirdly, if you want to bring the, the fight that the public have, and it's a real and, 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 and very necessary challenge, by the way, uh, to government on the ETOL matter into the vehicle licensing space, well, then all you will do is bring the unintended consequences of people not licensing their vehicles. Now you have a bigger problem, and I'm not for one minute advocating that. I'm telling you it's going to happen. And then we will have to go and defend people for that, and we'll have to reverse this whole decision. So, uh, look, enforceability was always it's, uh, this, this, this scheme's downfall, and we've said all along that uh, it was going to be problematic. In fact, it is so it is so problematic this system that even the people who get free passage I'm talking the taxis and the and, and, and the uh, uh, tour um, in the buses and that they don't have tags fitted. Now, if you go to a, a sector of the society and say, look, we need you to tag it because you ha to get the free passage you you, you must uh, fit this thing. I mean, the gantry doesn't recognise this as eyes and and not billet and they've said no so how do you minister a system where even the free uh, uh, right doesn't even apply or can't be uh, uh, can't be administered but i just want to come back to the, the, the this this issue that was uh, was said earlier on about the um uh, the, the, the fuel levy. I mean, the fuel levy does feed uh, into into the fiscus. We know that it's not ring fence, but government does allocate through all its taxes uh, a tranches mm. to Sanral to build roads. All it had to do was allocate another two billion. The fuel levy, by the way, has gone up by another fifty billion in the since this decision was made. So it's not as if the money isn't there. They could have fi funded this uh, matter. And the other thing is we're not, so for one minute, saying don't go and upgrade the rest of the freeway network. By the way, they're not San Rolls roads, those roads. They belong to the region. The region and the province and the, and, and the municipalities must continue with their road upgrades and that. I and, think... And sorry, and on, on that point of 1%, just 1% of this freeway, is Gauteng's freeway. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that Sanro was billed uh, or had billed the public over this first four full years of, of, the, uh, of, of ETOL's running was going to generate for Sanro 34% of their revenue from 1% of their road surface. Now, where's the justice and the user pays in that? And again, I think it's a, it's a get skewing the facts. So I would like to respond, first of all, let's uh, deal with the fuel levy because I think the fuel levy is quite an important conversation. Um, I think Wayne will agree with me that the fuel levy is a diminishing fund, and that's quite a very important concept. What I mean with that is if you look at the fuel imp uh, increases over the last 10 years compared to the fuel levy increase within that fuel rate, you'll see that it's disproportional. So the fuel, um, I think the fuel price increased by about 80%, uh, while the fuel levy within that price increased by 100%. Why is that? Because vehicles become more effective and more fuel efficient. And as a result of that, you actually, the government, because with one liter of fuel, you can now travel a longer distance. That means that government uh, people buy less fuel and with more efficient vehicles. And as a result of that, they actually um, end up with not having enough money or not enough income. And that's why there's this disproportional income. That's why we call it a diminishing fund. And in fact, there's, a, there's quite a nice study that was done by the University of Stellenbosch in this, to, to this effect. The, the second problem with the fuel levy is that it's an indiscriminate tax. What I mean with that is, is that if you look at the vision of GFIP originally, it was not to burden people that are in the lower income brackets with an additional tax. It was actually to say that um, businesses, the high income brackets, will have to fund this. Um, and, that, and that's the reason why public transport is exempt. Uh, in a fuel levy scenario, nobody's exempt. So that means that people driving with a, their taxi every morning, they pay for the fuel that's in the taxi and therefore they contribute to the fund. We 
the, the second argument that's also a very important argument then is to say, well, okay, so if people stay in, um, in Springbok and they put in fuel, they are effectively contributing to a fund for Gauteng. Can it not be ring-fenced for Gauteng? <coughs> well, I mean, I don't know. It remains to be seen. But, I mean, Ota, uh, a couple of months ago, if you, if you remember, in the Western Cape, the Western Cape wanted to implement such a ring-fenced fuel lever. They actually wanted to try and raise additional funding uh, for the Western Cape to start funding some of the infrastructure. And Ota was opposed to that. So I'm no, not sure... That's not wise. So provincial fuel levies are just opening up a whole new can of worms. But we must mm-hmm. just be careful. We're not saying... It just use the fuel levy. Fuel levy was one option. We said back then. Now, of course, we know we cars get more and more efficient. Had they done this, though, by the way, then they would have really raised the finance for the bond, which they haven't even started to settle. So the more you prolong this, the more this does become a bigger problem. So, so start now. But the fuel levy is just one element. We've said from the fiscus, because you must understand, this is the economic heartland of this country. The heart beats here. This is a cash-positive province, this in the Western Cape. We are funding what's happening in Springbok, in the Eastern Cape, in KZN. They earn money from what we uh, deliver here. So what we're saying on this 1% of freeway network, if we need eight-lane highways to get this province to and from work and goods to and from markets quicker and better, give this uh, province eight-lane highways because the positive benefit and spin-off is GDP growth. And even the president in 2013 who reviewed state-owned entities, recommendation number 21 says uh, that social infrastructure, and they say including roads, this is the roads we use daily to get to work, we pay taxes, should not be so, or should be subject more to a, a normal taxation for, uh, for funding and less to a user pays mechanism. And that's from the research that comes from the presidential office. So it makes sense. I think the, the, the issue about the, the, the fuel levy is that what you will find is, is that, I mean, with new technology, people can actually buy themselves out of this, this fuel levy. So what we see in the next five to 10 years with more electric vehicles coming on board is that that fund is going to diminish even more drastically. That means that the fiscus, the amount of money that currently it's the fourth largest contributor for tax, for income, for government, apart from VAT, um, pay as you earn and, and companies tax. It's the fourth largest contributor. It will diminish even more with, with uh, electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. So what you have is, in my view, is you have a very disproportionate and a contribution. So you have people traveling with their taxis, filling up with fuel, contributing to a tax where the wealthy buy themselves an electric vehicle and they use the road for free. Now, I'm not sure what you think, but I think that that is a recipe for disaster for the socioeconomic issues in South Africa. Um, so I honestly believe that, yes, there's a conversation to be held. Um, I think we need to find, there are also hybrid models that we can think of in terms of how do we fund um, uh, infrastructure. Mm-hmm. But be it as it may, the, the point, and I think this is the, the, the crux of it, is that Ota's view, and in my, my perception, is, is to say to people, do not pay your mm-hmm. ETO. Yeah. What that ends up being is, is that that ends up being an additional interest charge every month to us as South Africans. So Sunroll raised uh, bonds on the open market, and it's clear in the report um, that those bonds are now with interest is about just 40.5 billion rand. That's in their latest financial statements, 40.5 billion rand. So the 17 odd or whatever the investment was has grown with interest to 40.5 billion. Why? Because Sunroll has not been able to pay the capital. And why has it not been able to do that? Because yes, we the, the, the contribution to the scheme is poor. It's very low. Um, and, and this creates, exacerbates the problem because in the end, and this is the end game, the end game of this is that if somebody says to tomorrow, if the president, for example, and just listen, just look at the scenario, if Pre- President uh, Ramaphosa says switch off the gantries, mm. immediately the 40.5 billion rand becomes payable mm-hmm. no. by government. Because the 40.5 billion <coughs> rand that Sunroll has raised on the open market becomes payable. That means that we or uh, the government will have to pay back the bondholders 40.5 billion. 
because, Immediately. So. because the covenant is broken. The covenant is you have to prove that there's an income stream. The moment that you switch off the income stream, the covenant is broken. It becomes payable. Now, where is this money going to come from? This thing is going to be worse than, than, um, than the SAA bailout. It will, it will certainly downgrade the sovereign debt of South Africa. So what we are busy with is, yes, I understand that people are upset. I have an appreciation for that. But the longer that we do not deal with this problem, the bigger we as broader South Africans uh, are going to eventually face this problem with. And if you look at government spending and you look at, um, if we look at uh, what they call irregular spending, government also classifies interest as irregular spending. Why? Because they're saying you sh we should have the money, you should not have incurring debt or be late in your payments to incur <coughs> interest charge. And if you look at the interest charge that we've already accrued on phase one, that could have gone a long way to build phase two already. So I think what happens to us sometimes is we get into this, this spin that says, you know, we are upset, uh, we do not want to contribute, but in the end, we will all suffer. Wayne, if we switch yeah. off the gantries tomorrow, is South Africa facing a fiscal crisis? Well, the gantries are effectively switched off. I mean, they're not paying. They're no, hardly no, covering no, enough. No, 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 no. Just done. talk about we'll facts. Yeah, but, but, but you make but a effective. statement to say it's switched okay. off. It's not switched All right, off. I'll tell you what. Keep them on. It keep them on, on and people stop paying anyway because they're not paying. So but effectively... It's switched on. Yes. Just so leave the them facts. on. So leave them on. The facts. Okay, so leave them on. But effectively, you're not getting the money. So... If that's going to help uh, uh, not trigger the, the default, then leave the lights burning, leave your little counters uh, counting away, and the people don't pay. That, the reality that, that, that Sanral and EDZ are not coming to is when they say, but the people aren't paying. Well, why is that? That's the real issue here. Why do you think they're not paying, and how do you think you're going to change that? That's not going to change because this scheme requires people to trust. People need to trust in government, and people lost the trust of this scheme a long time ago, and you're not going to turn that around. And let me explain to you something. The intent, uh, uh, Sanral's intent uh, on the whole GFIP uh, uh, construction project, uh, 350 kilometers, 340 kilometers, by the way, back in 2005 to 2008, stated that the 340 kilometers would be upgraded at a cost of 4.5, uh, 4.5 billion. Four and a half billion. Now, that was just three years before they started to build the road. This in is the original phase This one. is it. Yeah, this is – no, well, they, they had marked all phases of 340 kilometers. Now, when mm -hmm. Sanral, who knows the cost of road building, who, know, who knew what this project was going to uh, be, they didn't wake up uh, the next year and just start planning it. They've been planning it. When they state in a document that the 340 kilometers are going to cost four and a half billion – and then 186 kilometers of that, just three years later, is costed at, at well, it went up, by the way, all the way up to, to 17.9 billion. So, uh, you know, just under half of it uh, becomes four times or three times the price of what the entire project is. Mm. You start to wonder what's going on. And let me explain this to you as well, because this is where the mistrust comes in. When, you, when we start to look for, can we see and can we find all the content around the uh, uh, builds of quantities of this road? Do you know that if you go into the data build systems where Sanral's projects, stadiums, uh, uh, dams, big construction projects are, everything is found there except for the GFIP. They removed it and took all that information away from the public's eyes. Now, why do you hide that information and give all the other information on your other roads? Well, it's deceit. And what we had to stop was Sanral becoming the beneficiaries of an extremely deceitful campaign. That's what this was. And as I've said to you, 34% of your revenue coming from 1% of your roads, this is Sanral, what they would have got had, had everybody paid their ETOL bills. They would have received 22 billion rand for this, 23 billion rand for the last four years from this 1% of their roads. I mean, that is ludicrous. You cannot expect a, a Sanral, I mean, Gauteng residents to fund a Sanral to that extent. It's not going to happen. Again, I think it's not the full picture. Let me explain the full picture. So, yes, Sanral, when they raise the money, they have to raise enough money to pay for the operator. They have to also raise money to pay for the cost that they've raised these bonds for. They have to repay the capital and some interest. And they also have to generate money to start building the next phase. Because remember, the GFIP as it stands right now is not the final product. There's an additional 405 kilometers of road that needs to be constructed. Oh. And if we do not do this, the 
And this was an independent report by the Department of Transport, the Gauteng Department of Transport. Then the average um, speed in the next 20 years will be less than 10 kilometers an hour on, the, on our freeways. So we have an obligation to try and find ways to build. I think we this can. is we just build. what we are saying, Wayne, is we're saying we can live in the past and we can say that the, I mean, nobody's been able to prove any collusion. Nobody's been able to prove any deceit. There was deceit. collusion on the freeways. You know that. Well, well with not, but let's be companies. Le, with construction companies, it's a separate thing uh, to the tolling. And how does Sanrail allow them to pull their uh, wool over their eyes like that? But Wayne, I mean, they, they, I mean, they know what roads cost. The reality of that is, is that those companies have paid their dues. No, they haven't. They, they have. slept on the wrist. And that, was, that was an absolute uh, a farce and, and, and an insult well, to paid, society. I don't know if a company pays what? 800 million rand, that that's just a slap on the wrist. Mm-hmm. What I can say, however, is that this is the reality, is that if the cost was, uh, if the cost was excessive, there's been no official inquiry that has been proven that except out There hasn't been respond. an official inquiry. The you second point, the second point is important, and that is that we still have this problem. So after we've had the inquiry and after we've understood that yeah. perhaps Sunro paid, I don't know, even a couple of percentage points more than they should have paid. I don't know what it is. I don't have an idea. We will still come back to this very situation that says we have 40.5 billion rand to repay. Yeah. We have to find ways to build new roads. And if we do not do this, then, then South Africa's economy will suffer. The Gauteng, um, the Gauteng um, uh, province contributes 40% to GDP. We all know yeah. it. Yeah. So you, you, you stifle this. And we, it's the 1% of the road. <laughs> but the 1% of the road funds the rest of the GFA projects. And you have but to find that. You can't, well, you can't do that because the rest of the GFA projects, by the way, are not uh, San Rolls roads, firstly. It, well, They're not. And if, they, and if the province is handing them over to you, there's an issue with that. But let me ask you this. You keep making out as if you can't build these roads unless you toll them. Uh, the, no. uh, let me remind you again. There is a 76-kilometer a, a freeway upgrade between Durban and Maritzburg for 15 billion rand not being funded. So those is roads Is that currently there, under construction? Why? Those, Have you seen the, the tenders are out there? The, 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 con- the discussions taking no, place? No, the tenders are not out. I know the tenders are not out. And well, so, they've been talking about so it. They've they, been they, talking they, they, about they, it, and, Wayne. And, but they, and they talk so, about 15 billion rand. But you talk about that as if it's a fact. It's not a fact. And the, the fact and the, of and the, the Mount matter Edgecombe is... the upgrade? The Mount Edgecombe upgrade, what I said, is 1.6 billion. So 1.6 billion is it's about 8 percent of 22 billion and that's the issue it's easier for the fiscus to find 1.6 billion especially if you have built mount edgecombe interchange over the four years that it took it to build no one's saying you can't build these freeways we must build and, them there's, and the there's point money that i want to make pot. so it's not going to come from gfa it's not going to come from tolling you know that but what we Details are saying are not pay what it. we are saying wayne is that Actually, 85% of our roads is actually funded through the fiscus. We have to come up with other you solutions. could have done 86%. So the problem for, for the economic is, so, so let's, talk about, let's talk about some real solutions. So yeah. Well, let's, let's take a step back yeah. for a moment. Um, okay. let's, let's, Kuni, did, did, I mean, maybe it's a bit of an unfair question because you re- recently joined the, ET, the ETC mm. business and a lot of this stuff happened before your time. But... Do you think that Sanrol rushed into this too quickly? Did it consider all of the options available to it, or did it set its mind to doing e-tolls and then set so out to do that project without proper consultation? The best way I can answer that is let me create context. Okay, it's all about context. So yeah. context is that, and 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 um, at the point at that point in time, I actually worked on the Madupi power station project, uh, and. I know that there were a number of projects that were happening. Um, uh, one of them being the Gauteng train and the other one being the GFIP. And what happened very importantly in 20, 2010 was that we had to host the World Cup. Mm-hmm. The, instruction, the instruction from national, uh, national executive was get these roads built because we needed the roads to host the World Cup. So it was rushed. So. I wouldn't say it was rushed. One, uh, one thing that I can say is that the, you cannot rush the environmental approvals that was needed, the building regulations and all of those. What I can, however, say is that you, when you have to construct at twice the speed, yes, there's a premium to pay because you build not perhaps as efficient as you want to build normally. You have to build things in three years as opposed to seven years. 
So there is a premium to pay for that. But the the payoff for that was the World Cup. Mm -hmm. The World Cup contributed 100 billion rand to to the income line in in South Africa at that point in time. So I think it is really important for my side where, where I say it is about context. It is about, it's the same with the, the Gau train. Gau train had instructions to finish certain sections of the Gau train and get that open before the World Cup. But what are you saying in the context that you can ru- run roughshod over constitutional rights? It wasn't. What? I, I'm not saying it. And Public there is, consultation is a constitutional right and it was run roughshod over. No, you cannot it, deny it. It wasn't. That. There is high court evidence that where they've ruled, Wayne, and you know it, no. they've ruled. They've ruled on no, the, 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 and U, they, the Supreme Court and they reversed ruled. those that, that judgment completely. No, it didn't reverse. They allowed it. them to no, carry on. It wasn't reversed. They no, they the, said that they shouldn't have made the decision on that matter. And but they it never it reversed. Continue. It never reversed the ruling. If the technicality, if you well, we'll refer to the court, technic- we'll prove it in the con- uh, we in have the to defense's do that. challenge. I agree that the, that the public the, consultation process was an absolute. The reality farce. of that is that there's a court ruling in the High Court that stands today that says you that there tell. was adequate. Yeah, no, that you and can you tell. can tell. Yeah. So, so let's just, those are the facts. Yeah. If, if OTA believes it's different, then they need to go to court and prove their opposite. We are going to court, you know that. There's yeah. a test case coming. Well, that's also, I think, a, a big argument mm-hmm. because it's four well, years in the making. I mean, I, what's I do. four years in the making? The, going to court. I mean, um, I'm not sure that OTA actually wants to get to court. Well, we're happy. We're waiting for you. We're no, waiting. we're not. We're uh, waiting absolutely. for you. We are not what? waiting. What are you we're waiting for? We are waiting for you. You guys, you guys don't want us to bring the uh, the regional court matters into the high court. Why not? Because there are individuals there that have very strong arguments about the fact. Listen to this. They're not on the internet. They don't live near your etol centers. They cannot participate in the scheme. They do not get their post. And you, you cannot criminalize people when they cannot cannot efficiently or effectively participate in the etol scheme. So yeah. they will be found not guilty. The important thing, Wayne, is mm. that if if OTA is honest and and sincere and mm. serious about sorting this out, because we all want finality, let's get it to court. Yes, so we're let's, happy. We're happy. We, we are ready. Well, so I mean, Sunroll has asked for a case manager from the judiciary. No, no, no we Be- did. No, it's actually oh, God, opposite. What you see? I mean, because this is absolute nonsense. Wayne, We've been dragging this thing. We've gone now to the, uh, the other high court. No. The case manager's been appointed. We want this matter brought to court quickly. What exactly is being taken to court? Well, there's what a defenseless the challenge because uh, in the Supreme Court of Appeal, Sanro was said, right, you guys can go ahead, but when somebody ch- ch- when you subpoena somebody and they want to raise a defensive challenge, they can. And, get, and guess what? That is now happening. And I can tell you right now that, that Sanral lost this exact same case in Western Cape, High Court, Supreme Court, Constitutional Court. And by the way, the judge ruled very sternly against Nazir Ali and the team for some serious transgressions that have happened. Very, very serious ones. I can tell you right now. Again, and Wayne, these will come out in, the, in this no, matter. Again, I, again, no, you can't you, ignore you, that. That you case call, happened. You, 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 mix, you mix issues. The one is to speak about the Western Cape. And I think those court cases have been heard. Yes. And I think it's and very what clear what happened. What but happened? it is not the GFIP. Well, the, the only difference is the is, GFIP, no. the road's been built and the money was borrowed. The, That's the only difference. It doesn't no, make it, it is legal. Not. There, is, there is a ruling yeah. by the High Court yes. that stands today that says... You can that tell. You can tell. And it says that there was adequate public oh, okay. consultation. You know it as well, well as I do well, because well. that was what was presented. So, But, do you, mean, but do, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, can you just answer this question. Do you believe, because this is what happened, one advert in six newspapers, the advert hidden in the business and one of them in the international business section, do you believe that 28 responses and the three and a half million motorists, and you know, it was in that court case, there were 28 responses. Do you believe that that was adequate consultation? Do you think that's adequate? You know, the amount of advertising that you guys have been doing here, why didn't they do that at the time? Why didn't they put billboards up? Why didn't they have town hall discussions on this to get the public's input? Why did not one fleet owner know about the scheme until the gantries were going up? That is not adequate consultation. So really, you don't go on on a massively complex scheme like this and and do the bare minimum. The law's bare minimum says minimum 30 days in advert and newspaper. What does Sanral do? The bare minimum. That is not adequate consultation. That will be proven in this court case. So So do you you believe that was adequate, by the way? My my view of it is that... You even said uh, in the media it wasn't... My view of it is that the the average road user 
does not believe that it was adequate. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that they, there's a legal problem. And, and you see, this is where I think we, it is, we have to get into solution mode in South Africa. We can constant, uh, the, the other thing- We're happy, I, by just, the way, just, to find just, solutions. Just, Wayne, I just wanted to, yeah. the point that you raised yeah. was, for example, that there's this distrust in government. Yes, okay. in San Rals, I think it is a, a, there is distrust. Yeah. But what you can be assured of is that the, the tolling projects are ring-fenced. I, I mean, we have the Auditor General permanently in my office, auditing, checking, verifying every single transaction. What I can give the, gov- uh, the, the road user out there the confidence is that no money is disappearing. Everything is accounted for. And that is the important thing is that we, I understand that, that the public can be disillusioned with government today. Yeah. But we shouldn't mix these issues because government is one. But the other part is that this is a ring-fenced scheme that is audited and validated and everybody anybody can have insight into that where it's accounted for well we know we know south africans are gutful with government wastage and corruption etc do you think that e-tolls was something that just galvanized public anger and well here's something the government's doing we're going to take it out on this yeah. absolutely i think exactly that happened i think this was a message that that uh that society used, it's a lot easier to withhold your ethos than it is not to pay tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it was a way for society to speak up to government about abuse, about corruption, whatever the case might be. But we should not then, we should not convolute the argument by saying that that is an ethos problem. Well, but, but it is. St- it's not about the ethos. Nobody has been able to prove that there has been see. corruption, there has been misappropriation of mm-hmm. funds, or anything. And and if we want to say yes, the scheme was expensive in in building the construction work, I, I can't comment on that. Mm-hmm. But I think there needs to be process to follow through. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean, in my view, that we can continue to advocate that we have public disobedience because this is the kicker. On the one side. I, I, and, I, and I say that honestly, mm. Wayne. I mean, I have so much appreciation for what OTA does. I think it is, I mean, we need civil society that actually speak up for and on behalf of our citizens. And that, I think, is crucial in a, in a, in a good uh, democracy. But at the same time, you, we can't say that we want to make sure that our tax money is properly spent, but we will also at the same time say that we will promote civil disobedience. Mm. And that is the well, issue. We see the same thing at the SABC, of course. I mean, t- people don't pay their TV licenses. But, and, and this is why I believe we've, we have to start working around fixing South Africa. So mm. if you've listened to my messages, my messages are, I am absolutely not worried to say, does it need to be ETOLs? Yes or no? I don't care. What I am saying is, we as South Africans need to change our view of the world. We need to start fixing our, our country. Well, exactly. And we need to find solutions to it. So it's one thing to criticize the past. And yes, I, we can find a hundred of different problems, but it is time, I believe, that we start looking at alternatives and, 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 and solutions. And I think that is what we need to do. If we can just agree on one thing to say, Let's find solutions for South Africa. Then I, but Kuni, that's what that, I have hope for our country. That's how this started, and you mustn't think that the people just latched on to. Uh, okay, well, let's not pay ETOs to teach government a lesson. If ETOs was right, if ETOs was done properly, if the trust factor was there, if it was good for this country, we would sell it that way, and people would pay. We would be fighting. I'm the first one to say that I would put an e-tag in my car if there was an integrated public transport system that came out of the public engagement processes because you don't solve a congestion just through widening the road. It becomes induced again in the next uh, five to seven years. A lot of research is done on this. And and the tolling, by the way, in, in the countries where it does work, that money doesn't go to the road construction bonds, by the way. It goes into the uh, public transport integrated systems. It improves the public transport system. That's what happened in London and in Stockholm. And they ran referendums to get the approvals of the people. This is what good public, public consultation is about. But Wayne, is there a danger 
danger, just coming to back yeah. to what Kuni said, is there yeah. a danger in, in fostering civil disobedience around an issue like this that people are going to say, well, to hell with it, I'm not paying for anything anymore? No. Well, you see, that's, uh, and, and that's where we have to be very, very cautious. We were asked on many occasions, I can tell you now, for the last two years up until Zuma left, we were asked to start this tax revolt, you know, a big, meaningful tax revolt uh, around the country. We had to caution people, you do not want to go there. You, you will, the, the ramifications of you never recover from that, firstly. Secondly, we have to be law-abiding and tax-abiding. And, uh, and then there's this contradiction on the e-tolls. Um, when, when uh, there was a big call on the, on the, on the TV licenses, and, and, once the, uh, and there's obviously going to be low tax morality, especially on that one when it's 260 rand a, a, a year, and it costs you more to try and summons people. So they don't summons, they can't, and people stop paying. And, and, and what we're saying to government is this is the time when you take a, a stock of the situation. This is what they had to do many years ago when they decided to scrap the bicycle license or a dog license. I mean, mm -hmm. the time for TV license is to go. Now, what happens? Government needs that money, and it comes coming to the question that uh, Kuni put in on the, uh, with regards to fuel levies as they start to diminish. Of course, they're going to tax tax uh, revenue streams change over years, and what you have to do is find new ways. So you might put that tax onto the batteries of the expensive cars or for whatever it is. So you will find ways to get the revenues, and and we need to put in the most efficient and the most effective tax schemes in this country so that you don't have to run around chasing people, even if you've got 80% compliance, 20% of them, because it's costly. Mm -hmm. And the Portugal uh, t tolling scheme that has failed, the same thing they said, we, we got 80% compliance and it come, becomes too costly to chase the 20%. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at alternatives. So we're not for one minute advocating uh, tax immorality and just stop mm -hmm. paying. But when you have to be focused on a specific matter, and we are on this, just as the people had to defy a past law in the past because it was the most gross and irrational law at the time. You have to defy, you have to become civilly disobedient to get the message through to government that if you want to run roughshod over a process, if you want to put in place schemes and systems that are unworkable, that are not in the best interest of the public, then you must feel the wrath of the public. And that's exactly what's happening here. But we are, are extremely uh, uh, um, uh, cautious to say that this must now flow out into anything else. But, but of see, course that's going to happen. That's exactly the point the point is is that and and i mean people can go and research it I, I mean they don't need to take my word for it people can go to the high court and see that there is a ruling that says doling is legal it can proceed mm. it can it i mean now we're saying because the one thing in my view that has saved south africa so far is our democracy and mm. the judiciary mm -hmm. the judiciary has saved us from government that uh, is uh, was I think had corrupt elements in it that actually, I mean, we see that uh, happening at currently at the, at, the, at the Zondo Commission. So if we now say that the very same judiciary that we invest in, that we rely on mm. to actually hold the national executive accountable, government accountable, we defy that because we don't agree with the outcome, then I think it's like, you know, you, you can't have your cake and eat it. Sometimes we as South Africans have to understand that there is, I don't like paying tax. I really don't like paying tax. I don't mind paying tax. Okay. I don't know of anybody except you, Wayne, that <laughs> likes paying tax. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> okay. But the issue is that we, can, we, we, sh we must be careful not to create a lawlessness society. Because if we continue down this road, I'm really concerned that what is next? So people don't pay for their houses or their bonds because I don't pay for, I currently don't pay for, no, for okay, electricity. Nobody's saying that. I, I really. don't pay for water. I, I then don't pay for toll. I don't pay for anything. Mm. So we can't have this lawlessness in South Africa. Out of interest, well, I mean, toll compliance is sitting where? Around 20%? No, no. 25%? No, it is sitting roughly between 27 and 30%. Okay. Depending on depending on whether uh, Mr. David Bakuro makes a statement in the public. All right. So let, let's say yeah. uh, let's say uh, up mm. to a third of, of, of yeah. motorists in Gauteng are paying their e One and four. How one and a half million users. How, That's the quantity. How should those people feel, given that the vast majority are not paying? I think they I think they're quite upset, mm. and I think they also are upset with government to say that. I have been paying. I have been the responsible citizen. And government, how have you held the people that are not paying accountable? Because that's quite important.
Well, I think I think it goes beyond that. They are paying under duress. A lot of businesses would rather not pay. They're fed up with this. They can't reconcile their accounts. But it's it, a mess. The people that are, are, are trying to do dispute resolution with Sano, we get them. We get complaints. People in uh, getting bills have never been on these roads. And then Sano has the audacity to say, well, you, we've looked at your complaint and sorry, you must just pay. I mean, they said, well, what do I do now? So we'll just, just tell them you're not going to pay and keep your records of, of their ludicrous responses to you because that will stand you good in court. And there are thousands of these, not just uh, any. And well, you must also well, understand. It's actually not true. No, really. but it I is mean, true. No, yeah, we Wayne, see them. We because see them, I uh, actually Kuni. deal with it. Yeah, if you look I at also four deal with if you have four and a half million road users, four and a half million, then there are going to be people yeah. that for a number of reasons their accounts are not are not accurate. Seriously, hundred percent. I mean, even the High Court ruled uh, that they couldn't even use the information from this e, uh, from the electronic tolling system because it was wrong on the Dudu Zani. Uh, no, it wasn't. As it was. No, you saw the judgment. The judge said this information is uh, no. It was ruled that what they recorded yeah. at at the at the um, at the emergency services was the incorrect data. The, the correct data was in the system. When the one thing that we must be careful for is to to discredit hard work that South Africans are doing. Because this is this, this this is the thing. You know, these kind of statements are really harmful to us. It it hurts the credibility. And I can tell you that there's a thousand two hundred South Africans working on this system every single day and they are committed to making the system work. They take a lot of abuse mm. and because I think the public are not always easy to deal with. But we should not we should not make the statements and, and this I can say to you. I mean I had to comply with additional regulations set by the NRCS. We have complied. So our system is fully certified and complied right. with. But it's not it, working. It no. is accurate, Wayne. But, it, the, but, but Kuni, the reality is, the reality is this. I mean, even if the courts say it's fine and you can go ahead and, 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 and you've consulted, the reality is you've got to be able to manage it and get all the users to pay. Or no, pay. Now, this is where I need problem. Otto's help. I would say, Wayne. But you're not going to get our help when? Why when, you, when the scheme was launched deceitfully, when you don't want to answer questions. Well, we want questions. Well, uh, if you answer all the questions that we've got, if there's an independent inquiry into why the tender uh, changed so much and the road there construction was. costs, there's a, no, there, was, there was no independent there is, inquiry. There's a, who, wh the public protector is there to protect the public, no, isn't the, it? The, the independent inquiry I'm talking about, which explains why the bond, uh, why the uh, tender amount went from 4.6 uh, billion uh, for your contract, by the way, and you should know what that is, to to over uh, 8.4 billion rand on the operating service we want the detail not the fact that i will vet uh, add it to that vet is 14 percent out of 77 percent and we want an independent inquiry because our research shows that that road construction by the way the gfip and now just go back to what i said earlier on 4.5 billion was what sanral said just three years before they started for 340 kilometers they end up paying 17.9 for 186 we pick up and this, this is with engineers giving us input that this road sh cost construction shouldn't have cost more than 10 billion rand, between 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to do the independent. We're talking about independent inquiry. And when we've engaged with uh, 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 and, and try and find this information on, on, on the internet where everything else is, it's missing. So there's too much smoke. There's too much that's wrong here, Kuni. So you're not but, going to get us no, but I think to agree. And, and on, sorry, and in the media... When Vuzi Mona misleads the public on the on the uptake numbers, you start shooting yourself in the foot when you're not transparent, when you're not open. So we will never, until this is cleared and all of these questions are answered, we will never support it. So it's important, Wayne, that again, because I think this is, I, I don't know what, what it causes, but when you mix you mix arguments, when I listen to your argument, you, you mention both the construction cost and the ETL cost yes. in the same sentence. It's actually fundamentally well, two different. We know that. Two different things. But they're related. But no. They are. <laughs> but the public that you inform, the public that you have an obligation to Can share an honest, transparent view with, you are not giving Kuni, them that we've always separated picture. the two. No, the, I just listened to what uh, you conversation. Exactly. We can replay it. Right they are, of you course. mentioned the construction of four and a half, and then you mean, mentioned our yes. contract of four and a half. They the are, average public do not even understand that conversation. Do you, do you know, Kuni, that if the road construction cost had have come in at 9 to 10 billion rand, that now, uh, and we're talking all things being equal, had they got the money, the 
is what the cost of the administration would have been. So if the road was nearly half the price, I mean, how crazy is that to try and spend, which is what their contract is on the operating side at 8.6 billion, this is if everything had have happened, Again, they would have been funding. It's no, incorrect. No, it's no, no, factually. it's not. Well, I'll show you the contract. I'll you show, show you the show contract. contract. I can show you the you payment certificates. The yeah, payment certificates are way less well, than Of course I, you're getting off. paid. Oh, no, you know why. Do you why? know why? Because why? you're not getting the money because the public no are not giving way. you the money. Absolutely. It is, again, it is a well, wrong perception. Have you seen we, your contract? Yes, I have seen. I read that contract every day. Uh, okay. And that contract is not based, it is not based on the fact that we get paid, uh, we get paid per rate. The contract so, that was signed. So I get paid for rates that I deliver Collect. services for. So I, for example, somebody says to me, Kuni, deliver me yeah. a person that sits behind the computer here, you charge me a rate. That rate was in the tender in 2009. That is what I get paid. I don't get paid a percentage of income. I don't get paid a percentage mm. of anything. Mm. So the misnomer that is created is to say well, that we don't contract. earn enough money because uh, the, the contribution is poor. That, that's we've that's got the not. Contract. Sorry, okay. Well, me. this actually leads me on very nicely yeah. to the next question I wanted to ask, and that's really to get an understanding of the collection of etols and where the money really goes. Mm. Um, so the etols are collected by ETC. That money then goes to Sanrail? The, yeah, ETC doesn't change. So we manage a system. The cash never gets into ETC's hands. It goes straight into the Sanrail. Sanrail toll account. And from there, it goes where? So from there, Sanrail utilizes that for their tolling operations. And that pay, yeah. So I, do, I deliver services. So Sanrail has a schedule. Well, let's say schedules. If you look at my contract, which is a public domain, it's a thousand two hundred pages. Mm -hmm. So there are the variety of services that I have to provide. Like I have to maintain the gantries, I have to upgrade equipment, I have to provide customer service center, I have to provide a call center. For each one of those services, we charge a monthly rate, and we get paid a f a, that monthly rate by Sunroll. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Now the gantries themselves and the technology that's used in the etols that was provided by a company called Capture. Yes. That's an Austrian company. Yes. Do they collect uh, a fee from every toll transaction? No. owns ETC, 100%. No. Don't so, they? two things. Don't they? Your question, mm -hmm. do they collect a fee? No. No. Absolutely no, ETC not. ETC does. ETC only recovers its money through providing a, a schedule of services. And if I do not deliver, I've got 106... Uh, 106 different KPIs that I have to con uh, to comply with every mm -hmm. single month. If I do not achieve those key perf performance indicators, I actually get penalized mm -hmm. for the services. So it is a services contract that we have. We do not get a percentage of the revenue. But this is the kicker. So the envisaged income is about 2.8 billion. I'm using your figures on your website. 2.8 billion. What is that in your, in your mind? It's roughly about those numbers. The argument that Ota raises is to say, but you know, we pay ninety percent uh, of the of the income towards towards the the the, ETO. the administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is the reason for that is because you have twenty seven percent compliance. If you had ninety percent compliance, there would be two billion rand mm -hmm. that would go towards Sunroll paying off their debt. Why do you have twenty seven percent compliance? Okay, that's the problem. The reason why we have two twenty seven percent compliance is because. Um, because OTA is actually promoting public disobedience. OTA only. Well, and the public themselves. They're part of it. And the public themselves. Of course, we are. So we're not saying no, but no, you, you well, we, all we, this blame on us. We are, we're having this conversation. Are you right putting now? all of this blame on us? Well, seriously, is the shoe fits? <laughs> I mean, I don't mind. I, I wish mean, we were that powerful. The thing for me is, is that we have to start turning this country around, and and this, I think is really, for me, that's important, is because if we are able, as South Africans, to find a solution to the GFIP, whatever that solution is, whether it is a, fund, a different funding scheme, a hybrid scheme, I don't care, we would have solved, I think, a very big problem for South Africa, and that is that we will have found a way to move beyond where we are stuck. I uh, believe South absolutely. Africa is in a hole. I think we absolutely have to get together to find solutions. Well, let's let's start but, to look but, at some but, of these but, solutions. Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly it. Um, we've provided 
opportunities uh, of solutions. We provided alternatives, used the existing mechanism right back when this thing uh, raised its head. And as we've said, we would have already funded the road. So that's the sad reality. And it's never too late to undo a bad decision. And to start with that right now, you know, if you had have gone and, and said to the public uh, four years ago, five years ago, you don't even have to, by the way, the Treasury doesn't have to. They've increased the fuel levy, by, by the way, yeah. by, two, by two rand and ten cents. And we just said, if, if it is a part of the solution, ring fence ten cents. Don't even have to ring fence it because Treasury takes it, as we've said, and uh, it goes into the pot. And then you say to Central, by the way, which they've done anyway. By the way, last year we gave you 10 billion. We're now going to give you 12 billion. And started out at about six or seven billion rand with this freeway upgrade was happening. But so we know that that's not true. The 10 cents. No, <coughs> no, 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 hold on. The 10, per, the 10 cents argument mm. is an argument that you raised in 2013 somewhere. Oh, no, now with interest it's going to be a bit more. Uh, of course, <laughs> it's, but one rand, rand, it's 1 rand 71. No, it isn't. Absolutely and, not. And this is the issue. The but, issue but is, Kuni, is that. Where do you get that from? Well, uh, we've we, shown we you, we've shown you that, that 22 billion liters of fuel times uh, 10 cents gives you the 2 billion rand, to, it's uh, 2.2 billion rand a year, which if you had have, uh, taken the uh, 17.9 billion rand, you'd be able to fund that through 2.2 billion rand a year over 24 years. You pay back PRC. And by the way, the share, the, 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 the bonds were given by PRC. No, PRC, it's not. It was in the open market. Uh, yeah, but PRC took that bond. You know that. No, not the old bond. Oh. So, yes. again, Wayne, they, I mean, this no. is, again, the, 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 there is a bit of misinformation here. Well, what's, because the, this is the issue. What's misinformation The misinformation that? is that those bonds are raised on the open market. I know they are, but the, PIC took those bonds. Not all of them. 20 billion rand. You only so, needed 17.9 so, for the road construction. So, so don't conflate it so, by throwing so in the all 40. the So the 40.5 billion that needs to be repaid in half the time. So this is what happened. Because we have not found a solution, the 20 billion has but become 40 fault, billion. But whose fault, is it that we haven't found a solution? You procrastinated. Government has procrastinated but for five years so, now. Well, what is the solution? I mean, <laughs> people are not paying. The yeah, majority yeah, I mean, of people you're not are not beat paying. People to you pay. say that the AARTO Act, which is going to come into effect when next year. Yeah. Um, I think it's quite a negative way to try and, and do it through summonses. I think so it how is. how do we fix it? I think, first of all, we actually need to get civil society, we need to get um, private sector, and we need to get public sector together to say, guys, we're going to find solutions for our problems. But okay. now, could you, just but we on can't, that point. But just, 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 okay. just finish. Just but we can't come. So if we are going to find a solution going forward, then we have to be, we have to inform the public in a very transparent way. We can't inform the public to say, if you paid 10 cents six or seven years ago, it would have been different because that's immaterial. The facts mm. that we have today is that we need a one round 71 okay. to, to, focus, to pay for 40 billion in half the time yeah, to well, settle the bill. Okay, but the, and you, that you're is trying the to problem. find the solution. Now, I, I just want to say this. If government was serious about finding the solution, you would have thought by now, just by now, four years later, where the scheme is in this situation, that a minister of transport would have said, Arta, can we have a chat? Because you seem to be a player here that's an influencing decision. Do you know that we've reached out right from the beginning? Spoon de Belle, uh, very, for the very brief period, uh, ben, uh, ben was there. I forget his uh, surname. Ngubani? Uh, hey? Ngubani? No, 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 no not, not him. His name ben Martins. Me. Ben Martins. Mm -hmm. uh, Dupio Peters went around. Uh, I had to come to her house three times to discuss. Nothing formal. It said, we need to discuss this. We sit here, Bladen Zamande, uh, previous minister, don't want to engage. Now, we have got... To get down. I agree with uh, Kuni, we've got to find the solution because we, we've we got to, these roads have to be paid for. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to do that. You negotiate with the bondholder, uh, who is PRC on this on this specific one, say, guys, we're going to have to renegotiate new terms, just as they're doing on the Eskom stuff, and, and there are problems there. Uh, society might have to contribute a little bit more in a fuel levy increase, although they've pushed that envelope uh, as far beyond where it can, but we might have to stomach that. There are many ways to do it. We've got solutions. We've got ideas. We want to talk. Do you think government's opening the door? Do you think government wants to? Well, if they don't want to, then how do you ask civil society to be part of the solution when you don't invite them in? You close the door on them the whole time. So please, if you're going to be serious about it, go back and have a chat with uh, Skumbuza at, at, at Sanral. Uh, bring the minister in. Bring Kasach in. Let's sit around the table and find the solution because we do want a prosperous country. We do want to yes. uh, pay for our infrastructure. We need all these freeways, uh, but there are other ways to do it.
We so know that. Beyond enforcement, I mean, you, you said let's mm. have a conversation. Yes. But specifically, no. what, what do you believe are the alternative So I think there are a number of alternatives. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, uh, one of the things that's not been clearly communicated to people is that what, what um, Wayne also alluded to is that there, there's a differentiation between the ETOL system and the ENATA system. The ENATA system is the national registry of data uh, of, of vehicles. Yeah. That is the Bible of vehicles in South Africa. We all know that that system is currently defective. Mm. It's flawed. It's mm. flawed. Mm. So it needs to be fixed. Here, on the other hand, you have this fantastic hardware, fantastic software that government, it belongs to actually the citizens. It mm. belongs to, it's an asset. So. My view on it would be to say, find ways of using this technology to fix inators, because we have to fix, uh, start fixing, for example, inators. Yeah. Then I think we also need to see how do we repurpose some of this this, this asset that we have, yeah. and and there are many ways of doing it. So. I'm all for finding those solutions. I'm all for saying, you know, repurpose the asset. All that I'm saying is Happy. we can't just switch off systems and no. think we our problems is going to go away because if those those no. problems will stick with us. Um, so and and if we can work together, then I think we will find well, that we, we actually have a lot of more common well, ground than we thought. I agree, and and we would we welcome sitting down with government and finding a solution. All we're saying is we've written, we've written, we've written and nothing's happening. So we will continue mm. until they say, let's chat, because I think we can find the solution. Yes. And, and Wayne, I mean, that for me, if, if that is the positive mm. outcome of today, then I am ecstatic because mm. that is all we want. I think, you know, for me, it's not about, it's honestly, and I, I've said that publicly, this is a higher calling, like it is for Wayne. Mm. The higher calling is for me is to say, if we are able to find a solution for society's problems, mm. then we will have a prosperous future for our next generation, and that's what it's all about. Yeah. That for me is where, where that's for me is what drives me. It whether it's an ETL system, whether we repurpose it, we reuse it for 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 policing or whatever the case might be. I, I mean, mm. but not do not destroy what we have because if we do that, then we are no better than people burning down a school because they're upset with service yeah. delivery. No, we've never we shouldn't, destroy. We shouldn't destroy systems. Yeah. And that's what I'm careful of, is yeah. that if we do that, then then, then we also in this anarchy situation. Yeah. Right. After our discussion today, are you optimistic that we can take this forward and resolve this without the courts being involved? Or do you think that ultimately it's going to be down to the legal system to decide the outcome of this entire uh, you see, project? You see, for us, um, it's sad when government goes to war, I call war in inverted commas, with its citizens. You know, there are three million vehicles that are on default on the scheme. Uh, and, and probably half of that is minuscule, so you can write that off. Even one and a half million, uh, owing substantive amounts of money. Um, are you going to, is government seriously going to uh, summons them because for the last two years they've been doing this. Mm -hmm. They've got to. They've served three, three and a half thousand summons. Has actually been uh, intention to defend have been noted. Where you, I mean that's just like a, it's 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 a pinprick in the in in the greater scheme of things. And and what are we hoping to achieve? Because even and I can tell you this now, even if a court says no, but you must pay to an to an individual, mm -hmm. you cannot suck the nine or ten billion rand that is owing out of this economy into that into that space. Firstly, mm -hmm. secondly, you might get that person, and you might get uh, 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 ten thousand people like saying, okay, out of fear, let me do something. But you're never going to solve this problem administratively. Uh, as you said, on the e natus matter, postal services, it is so cumbersome and so difficult to, 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 to go through in the context of this environment. This is not where your administrative systems and compliance levels are, are different. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, traffic fines here in, 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 in Joburg are 20% compliance. And it's sad that I'm not for one minute saying people shouldn't pay their traffic fines. It's a, just a sad reality that we have a de degradation of administration and we see it in local municipalities where we're doing a lot of work now. We see it in government uh, quarters, and we've got to become an efficient uh, country. And an e-tolling system is an efficient system when it's operated and managed with efficient uh, administration systems binding into it. But if it cannot be that way, then we have to find the alternative because flogging this horse is going to just – they're just going to spend more money to collect, and they're never going to get to where they need to be.
So before we wrap up today's session, mm. uh, maybe just a closing th thoughts from both of you uh, in 60 seconds. Where would you like to see this go next? What should happen next? Maybe to start with you, Kuni. Mm. I think what I would really like to see is I would like, really like to get the cases to court because that will bring uh, finality to the road user. The road user currently, um, I think, uh, needs the outcome of the courts so that we can be sure is it enforceable, not enforceable, whatever the case might be, and then there's clarity. I think that's first priority. I think the second priority um, is that I, th I think a lot more people want to start contributing, but the historic debt has become a major issue for them. So historic debt needs to be addressed by government. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, either some kind of an elegant solution, and I think government needs to look at this to see how do we allow people to earn back, for example, whatever they owe, rather than people having to, to settle their bills. I would really like to inform people so they can make up their own minds. For example, around what is the true cost of this, this ETOL system? And if you have this cost accumulated uh, or amortized over 600 kilometers, because that was actually the plan, then you'll find that the cost is actually uh, very effective, very efficient. Mm -hmm. But um, And then I would really want to us to come up with some really workable solutions. And even if that workable solution is is uh, is some different model than ETOL, I'm very happy to do that. But I think we need to start focusing our conversation around so what are the solutions and driving those solutions. And I think partnership with, with OTA, partnership with um, uh, private uh, businesses, I think is key. Um, and, and then I think, and, and that I think is really great for me, is to see public participation. What we've seen with this land issue is certainly there's been a lot more in integration and interaction from the public side. Mm. Wayne, your closing thoughts? Yeah, look, uh, from our side, we, we know we have to find a solution because uh, when a country continues to to go down a road that it's, you can clearly see there are problems uh, and it doesn't want to address that and find the solution with society, uh, is not doing itself any favours. So we, we would happily uh, work with government, and we always have, and we, by the way, we, we reach out and work with, with uh, the parliament and committees and government very, very constructively in many parts of this country, right now working with Special Investigations Unit and others uncovering corruption. So, so we are, are, are very uh, linked to, to, to finding solutions. Um, but it would be sad to say, well, let's talk about finding a solution on one sense, and on the other sense, out the other door, you are beating the public with these um, uh, thousands and thousands of sub summonses. So maybe you want to put a stay on that to say, let's find the solution, because maybe we can save a lot of money and save a lot of angst and, sa and, and, and save a lot of uh, 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 fight and pushback from society as well, because that's not making anybody happy there. So let's get the priorities right. Uh, let's try and find the solutions and let's be open and honest. We want answers to a lot of questions that have gone unanswered. And if we get those answers and we get the transparency, uh, we'll be a lot happier. If we don't, we're going to have to make up our own minds as to what's wrong and we will continue to fight this matter. Kuni Vermaak is CEO of Electronic Toll Collections and Wayne Duvenage is CEO of the organization Undoing Tax Abuse. This has been a fascinating discussion. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kuni. Thank you, Wayne. Hold on. Nice chat. Yes, definitely.